O Lord, my strength, the Lord is my foundation and my refuge and my and Holy Spirit, Trinity, co-essential and undivided. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our one true God, Greetings, everybody. God bless you all, and thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly video on this, the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. And we celebrate today, according to the church calendar, <clears throat> the afterfeast of the Nativity of the Virgin Mary. Joachim and Anna celebrates today, and many years to our Annas. They have many, they have many feast days throughout the year. Tuesday, Monday, Monday, is Minodora, Mitrodora, and Nymphodora, and St. Polcharia. I should be nice to hear all of these lives, even if it's a little synopsis. Tuesday is Theodora of Alexandria, and St. Afrosinus the Cook. Maybe all of us celebrate on this day because we're all cooks, are we not? Just imagine, in heaven, there's no cooks because you don't have to eat. Although you can eat, but you don't have to cook. Okay, and Wednesday is the apotheosis, the leave-taking of the nativity of the Theotokos. Then we have uh, fish, wine, and olive oil is permitted on Wednesday. Thursday <clears throat> is uh, pre-festival, is it, of the exaltation of the cross? St. Cornelius, the centurion, very appropriate. A dedication of the Church of the Resurrection, very appropriate. Friday is the exaltation of the Holy Cross. And all of our faithful, you fast. It's a fast day. No meat, no fish, no dairy, no eggs, no wine, no olive oil, nothing like that. But everything else is permitted, and be careful, don't overeat. Isn't that nice? Saturday is St. Nikitas, the Goth, and St. Porphyrius, the actor, the martyr. Let's go over. There's a lot of interesting things we're going to talk about in this video. And I hope everybody uh, don't get offended. But as Christ says, we are, or as St. Paul says, I am what I am, and we are what we are. So we have to speak the truth. But first, let's hear the epistles that we had. Now, the calendar has this Sunday, which is a Sunday after the Nativity and the Sunday before the Exaltation. So there are special readings that the Church prescribes. One of them is the reading of St. Paul to the Galatians, talking about the, maybe because it's the synaxis of Joachim and Anna. <clears throat> In chapter 4 of Galatians, it says, Abraham had two sons, one by the maidservant and one by the free woman. But on the one hand, the one of the maidservant hath been born according to the flesh, and on the other hand, the one of the free woman 
through the promise, which things are allegorized for. These are the two covenants, the two covenants. One indeed from Mount Sinai, which bringeth forth to slavery, which is Agar. For Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now remember, this is way before Islam. And that corresponds to the present Jerusalem, and she that slave with her children. But the, but the Jerusalem from above is free, which is mother of us all. This is St. Paul talking to baptized Orthodox Christians. For it had been written, <clears throat> Rejoice thou barren who bearest not, and thou bring, uh, break forth and cry. Now, why is the first covenant, because he says these are the two covenants. One is slavery. Well, that's the Jews. They got the law at Sinai, and they're enslaved to it. I think, you know, it's like, it's like the Protestants. They have a scripture, and they are slaves to it. They can't, get, they can't understand that there's more to Christianity than the scriptures. So the Jews, they're so wrapped around the law, they're, they're enslaved to it. But we are the Jerusalem above, which is free and mother of us all. And so what happened? God told Abraham, cast out the maidservant and her son, for in no wise shall the son of the maidservant inherit with the son of the free woman. What is the symbol of this? So then, brethren, we are not the children of the maidservant, but of the free. We are not bound by the law. We have, we are members of the second covenant. Christ said in the Old Testament, I will break my covenant, which I made with the children of Israel. Well, because they abandoned Christ. But the Protestants can't understand that. They can't understand that. So we are in the second covenant under grace. We are free of the law and of slavery to it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, in the another epistle for today, St. Paul is talking to the Corinthians now, and he's saying, brethren, keep on watching. Stand fast in the faith, conducting yourselves in a courageous way and being strong. Let all your things be done in love. I hope everybody that reads the scriptures will know how important faith is. Keep on watching, standing fast in the faith. The faith. The faith in our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, to put it another way, stand fast in orthodoxy. What's the faith that the apostles gave to everybody? It's the orthodox faith. The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you. Much in the Lord with the church in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The greeting of me, Paul, 
with my own hand. If anyone love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. If anyone love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be another. Well, it's obvious. St. Paul was not an ecumenist. There are a lot of people who love not our Savior. And they have no leg to stand on. There's no reason why not to love our Lord. The Lord hath come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. If anyone love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Now, can anybody, I'm wondering now, can anybody say that St. Paul didn't have love? Was he a hateful person? No. He w he traversed the world to convert everybody to the truth so they could love Christ. But he's not an ecumenist. And so people criticize us. You know, they criticize us. Why? They criticize us because they are ecumenists. And they have no justification at all for what they are doing and the way of life that they are living. They are living a lie. Who are they? Patriarchs of Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Rome. No, also for sure Rome, but they are, <clears throat> they are heretics also, but not orthodox. Um, Moscow, Serbia, all of them, they are living not an orthodox way as bishops. And so they attack us. They say, we just hate people. We hate people. They make that statement, and all of a sudden they say, how can they hate people? That's not the gospel. Oh, yeah, that's not the gospel. They say, we hate, and then they say, how can they be of Christ? Because Christ said, love everybody. So all of a sudden we're labeled as enemies. As enemies. Of what? Of the gospel, I'm sorry, you can't prove that in any way. Of ecumenism, absolutely, absolutely. We're enemies of ecumenism. And you could say, we hate it. And I could say right now, I hate it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it is falsehood. It's a heresy. Pure and simple. It was yesterday, commemoration of the Third Ecumenical Council. This council met in 431, in the time of the Emperor Theodosius the Younger. Two hundred holy fathers gathered from all over the Byzantine Empire, all over the world, the Orthodox world, and gathered for this council. The council condemned Nestorius, patriarch of Constantinople, for his heretical teaching that the Most Holy Virgin Mary and the birth of our Lord <clears throat> was, according to his opinion, not orthodox the heretical teaching of Nestorius. Nestorius would not call the Holy Virgin the Mother of God, but only the Mother of Christ. Only the Mother of his manhood, apparently. The Holy Fathers condemned Nestorius 
and his teaching. And they also confirmed that the Holy Virgin should be called Mother of God. Besides this, it confirmed the decision of the First and Second Councils, especially the Nicene Constantinople Creed, laying down that no one may add anything to it or take anything from the creed. That's the, first ecumen uh, the third ecumenical council. Now, I brought that now when we're talking about ecumenism. Because now, <clears throat> we don't have an Nestorius as Patriarch of Constantinople. We have a Bartholomew. Mm -hmm. Now, his heresy, Bartholomew's, is much worse than Nestorius. So, I propose let's call an ecumenical council together, right? Let's call it, and we could condemn Bartholomew and drive him out from the church. Now, let's see, who can we call? <laughs> uh, I'll come. Bishop John will come. And those are the only ones we know that are not heretical. You can't call any of the patriarchates to come and condemn their own teaching. That has never happened. So all the patriarchates, all the autocephalous churches, all the autonomous churches, they believe just like Bartholomew. So how can they come and condemn Bartholomew. No, it's not going to happen. So can we have an ecumenical council of two bishops? Mm -hmm. No, this is the last times, and that is not possible. But you could have a synod of 12 bishops, like the Russian Church Abroad. They gathered in 1983, and they condemned Athenagoras, not by name, but by his teaching, and Demetrius, Patriarch Constantinople, and Bartholomew, because of their teaching of ecumenism. The, tw the, the bishops of the Russian Church abroad gathered together and they anathematized ecumenism. How wonderful. Just like the Third Ecumenical Council gathered together and they anathematized Nestorius. How wonderful. Why? He was told, you are in error. Christ, God, was in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He was both God and man from the very conception. Marius Nestorius said, I don't believe it. I don't want to believe it. And I don't care if all the bishops of the Orthodox world say I'm wrong. I'm going to be like Arius. And I'm going to say, no, I am right. And everybody else is wrong. Well, this is what happened in 1983. World ecumenists, orthodox, they did not repent of any of the heresy of ecumenism. So they were justly anathematized. This is what happens when bishops think that they know more than the Holy Fathers. Okay, since we're going, going over the lives of the saints, the prologue, let's, uh, today, you think, yeah, St. Polcharia, the Empress, she, uh, we celebrate her. I hope Father Paul's putting up the picture of St. Polcharia. Mm -hmm. She was the daughter of the Emperor Arcadius, and she vowed 
to remain a perpetual, in perpetual virginity. As and as an earnest to this vow to show that she, this is, a, she made this vow and she's going to keep it. Just like when a monastic, when he makes a vow or she makes an, a vow to be a monk or a nun, there's nothing that can or should interfere. And to make a vow to show her earnestness, she had a table of gold and precious stones made, an altar table made of solid gold, probably for the church of Balkhana. She reigned during, uh, together with her brother Theodosius the Younger and was greatly zealous for the Orthodox faith. It was at her instigation that the third ecumenical council in Ephesus was summoned, which condemned the Nestorian heresy. That's very appropriate that we talk about her. The day before, we celebrated the third ecumenical council, and now it's St. Pocharia. She built the famous church of the mother, God of Blackerna, in Constantinople. After her brother's death, Theodosius' death, she married Martian, who was chosen as emperor and lived with him as a brother. They lived together as brother and sister. It was she who found the relics of the 40 martyrs of, Sebasti, of Sebast. See, when you have good rulers over you, holy people, holy people, the country, the empire is blessed. So the 40 martyrs, the relics of the 40 martyrs were revealed during her time. She entered into rest in the Lord on September 10th, 453, at the age of 55. So let's go back. Let's go back to the gospel now so we could finish the, gospel, the uh, scriptural readings uh, for this Sunday. It's a parable. Christ gave, uh, spoke a parable, and St. Matthew is, Matthew is recording it. The Lord said this parable, a certain man, a master of the house who planted a vineyard and put a hedge about it and digged the wine vat and in it in which to press grapes. And he built a tower and he let it out to vine dressers and went abroad. What can this mean? <clears throat> and when the season of the fruits drew near, he sent forth his slaves to the vine dressers to receive his fruits. This means that Christ established the first covenant. Yes, the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he established the temple. And he established uh, the religion that the Jews were to follow the law. He gave the law. That was the first covenant. And he sent slaves to the vine dressers to receive the fruits. And they are the prophets. The vine dressers took the slaves and indeed beat one, killed another, stoned another. And we see this happening over and over again with all the prophets, the holy people, that God sent to his, his people, the people of Israel and what they did to him. Not all of them, but just those in authority over the temple. The high priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. Again, he sent forth other slaves, more than the first, and they did to them in like manner. Afterwards, he sent his son, saying, they will respect my son, but after the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, 
Come, let us kill him, and let us gain possession of his inheritance. So this tells us that Christ knew that the rulers of Israel knew that he was the Messiah. They recognized him, and yet they killed him anyhow. And they took him, and it says, and they cast him out of the vineyard after they slew him. Well, he's describing what's going to happen to himself. Because when they killed him, they th it was outside of Jerusalem. It was in Golgotha. Whenever the Lord, therefore, of that vineyard should come, what will he do to those vine dressers? They say to him, he will evilly destroy those evil men and let out the vineyard to other vine dressers, which shall render to him the fruits of their season. And Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become head of the corner? This came to be from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Can you imagine? <clears throat> so our Savior prophesied exactly what they, the rulers of Israel, would do to him in this parable. And who are the other vine dressers? Those are us of the new covenant. And what's the fruit that he wanted? Meekness, love, faith, all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And what did they have? They couldn't provide any of that in the first covenant. They had hard hearts. Okay, on Saturday, oh my, a lot of things happened on Saturday. We had the Nativity of the Virgin Mary. And today is the day after the Nativity. So we celebrate the protagonists of the feast, Joachim and Anna, the main, the main personalities you could say, of the feast. And let's hear the synopsis of this from the prologue. Joachim was of the tribe of Judah, a descendant of King David. Anna was the daughter of Matan, the priest, of the tribe of Levi, as was Aaron, the high priest. This Matan had three daughters, no, it's good to everybody if you could memorize this. Matan had three daughters, Mary, Zoya, and Anna. Matan had three daughters, Mary, Zoya, and Anna. Mary was married in Bethlehem and bore Salome. Salome had sons, correct, Vidika? Mm -hmm. John, uh, Jacobus, and John, who became apostles of thunder, or sons of thunder. So, in a way, <clears throat> they were related to Christ. So Mary was married in Bethlehem and bore Salome, who bore the apostles Jacobus uh, and John. Zoya was married in Bethlehem and bore Elizabeth, the mother of St. John, the forerunner and Baptist. Zoya was married in Bethlehem and bore Elizabeth, the mother of the Holy Baptist. <clears throat> Anna was married in Nazareth to Joachim, and in old age gave birth to Mary, the most holy mother of God. 
Anna was married in Nazareth to Joachim and bore Mary, what, when they were 80 years old. Mm-hmm. Joachim and Anna had been married for 50 years and were barren. And, by the way, <clears throat> Zoya, as we said, was married in Bethlehem and bore Elizabeth. And remember, Elizabeth was barren also. Mm. And the archangel Gabriel came to Mary at the Annunciation and told her, you're going to bear a son. <clears throat> and what I'm telling you is true, because with God, everything is possible. And look at Elizabeth, your kinswoman. <clears throat> she is what, six months old, six months with a child. Her, she, who was called barren. And that's, well, well, Mother of God said, may it be unto me according to thy word. Because nothing is pos- impossible with God. And what did she do? She picked up and went on a pilgrimage to Bethlehem to meet Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, pregnant, Mary, pregnant, the babes leaped. In, in their womb. And Elizabeth said those wonderful words. Whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord, which means mother of my God. Mm-hmm. You've got to understand that. Lord and God are interchangeable in the scriptures. So she's the first one to call the mother of God, mother of God. Tell that to Nestorius. Will he wake up? Okay, <clears throat> so uh, Joy Kim and Anna had been married for 50 years and were barren and lived devoutly and quietly, using only a third of their income for themselves and giving a third to the poor and a third to the temple, and they were well provided for. Once, this is the instigation towards their prayer. Once, when they were already old and were in Jerusalem to offer sacrifice to God, the high priest Issachar abraded Joachim, you are not worthy to offer sacrifice with those childless hands. Others of the children <clears throat> of Israel jostled him <clears throat> and thrust him uh, to the back as unworthy. This caused great grief to the two aged souls, and they went home with heavy hearts. Then the two of them gave themselves to prayer to God that he would work in them the wonder that he had worked with Abraham and Sarah and give them a child to comfort their old age. Can you imagine, after 50 years, they had this prayer. Glory be to God. God sent them an angel who gave them tidings of the birth of a daughter, most blessed, by whom all nations of the earth will be blessed, and through him will come the salvation of the world. Anna conceived at once, naturally with Joachim. It wasn't like the Virgin Mary. It was like the normal uh, giving birth. And in the ninth month, gave birth to the Holy Virgin Mary. Joachim lived for 80 years and Anna for 79 years, and they both entered into the kingdom of God. How wonderful. Okay, now we have one more saint I want to talk about before we go to a lot of other interesting things. <clears throat> uh, last week, we celebrated the holy martyr 
uh, Athanasius of Brest. He was in uh, what we have now is uh, Ukraine. We all know where Ukraine is. Before, no one could even find Ukraine. But now, because of the war, everybody knows where Ukraine is. Well, the Holy Numata Athanasius, Slipovich was his name, Slipovich, born in 1596 to a poor nobleman's family in the province of Minsk, is best remembered as the abbot of the St. Simeon the Stylite Monastery in Brest, Litovsk, in the province of Gravdo, Gravno, in White Russia, which is today <coughs> Belarus, which is right next to the Ukraine. Okay, St. Athanasius became a zealot defender of the Holy Orthodox faith. He was a most extraordinary figure in the landmark struggle with the Latin Unia, in which, in what part of the Western Russia during early 17th century also is known as Little Russia. Because of his zealous monastic life, he was ordained to the priesthood eventually becoming Igumen of the St. Simeon Monastery in Brest, Litovsk. As Igumen, his life took on a new direction, demonstrated by his untiring, persistent, and loving struggle against those pressuring the Church into false union with the heretical Latin religion, mm -hmm. which was endangering the safety and salvation of his beloved countrymen. Of course. For eight years, the faithful shepherd of the Lord's flock spent his time in teaching and demonstrating everyone in true Orthodox doctrine, in writing and publishing educational material and writings of the Holy Fathers and in exposing the false union. You can't say that this man didn't have love. And you can't say that we don't have love because we expose the errors. And as I said before, people say that we just hate people. No, when you try to convert them to the truth, that's showing love. How can one describe, now it goes on, the despicable nature of the crimes committed against the Orthodox faithful under the Latins in the Uniat territory? Historians describe things that stun the minds and senses of those witnesses and victims of inhumane tortures, burnings, brandings, and other such persecutions, not to mention the unnecessary searches, investigations, trials, exiles, imprisonments, horrendously, the perpetrators of these crimes against the faithful Orthodox would go to such lengths as to barricade worshippers inside their temples and set them on fire, brutally destroying hundreds of people at a time. The most shocking hypocritical fact was that these offenders were doing these things in the name of Christ as so-called Christians, Latins, Roman Catholics, against those whom they claim they wanted to be unified with. They wanted these people to 
join a union with them, and when they wouldn't, they're going to kill them. Haven't we heard this with the 20,000 martyrs of Nicomedia? Haven't we heard this in the 1940s when the Serbian Orthodox people were gathered together in just one of their churches, it was, it was, I think it was of the Transfiguration, and they took pictures of them before they gave them the ultimatum. They gave them the ultimatum. Everybody here, what is this, a Jesuit priest or, or, a, or a, a Franciscan priest came into the church and told all these people in church, <clears throat> because it was a feast day, I think, of the Transfiguration. And they came in and they said, all oh, you people, the doors are locked. So if you want to get out, become Roman Catholic. And if you don't, you're going to burn with the church. And they didn't. And they set the place on fire and killed all those people. And they took pictures of them. Now, I wish we could find pictures. Maybe we should put it up. Maybe we could find it in, in one of the Serbian books. Mm -hmm. Horrible. But this is Roman Catholicism. If anybody wants to convert from Roman Catholicism, our, uh, our arms are open to them with love. But if we say these things and describe how these so-called Christians can do these as the reason is because of the lack of grace. They lost the Holy Spirit and they became heretics. This is how they have the audacity to do such a horrible thing. So, they persecuted St. Athanasius. Let it be noted that the Orthodox Church has never resorted to such satanic behavior in dealing with those of other religion, be they pagans, heretics, or Latins. The Orthodox Church has not done things like that. Western no notions of human vengeance and earthly punishments in connection with the Church are utterly alien to Orthodoxy. But in a sudden turn of events in 1645, St. Athanasius was arrested and imprisoned for two years. Then a new wave of persecution, more brutal than previous ones, broke out afresh upon the Orthodox by the Latin Unia. It was the source of great agitation and a popular rebellion in, and was initiated in Little Russia, led by the Cossack hitman Bogdan Kleminsky, in order to force the expulsion of the Polish Lithuanian forces from the land and return the territories to the Russian Tsar. But the Polish forces worked quickly and arrested Russian politician, political leaders and the Uniat Jesuits troops, huh, Uniat Jesuit troops, launched a campaign to arrest the Orthodox Church leaders. Being one of the first to be arrested, St. Athanasius, who was being accused of interfering with state church education programs, undermining the Union, which they were trying to force on everybody, inciting riot, sedition, as well as other charges. He was arrested in 1648 and experienced all manner of barbaric torture, both physical and psychological, by the express will of the Latin church authorities. After being transferred to a Jesuit concentration camp called in the Brest called the Brest Voridoka, where he 
already wounded and ill, suffered excruciating pain and physical tortures. He was burned with hot coals, branded with hot branded with iron rods. After being flayed in his flesh, he was roasted alive, but some so, uh, but somehow survived. In the end, he was dragged into the forest where he was shot twice and immediately offered his soul up to God. The malicious, malicious Jesuits, unsatisfied with the death of the saint, continued to afflict his lifeless body, finally beheading him and then irreverently forcing his body into a shallow grave of a narrow pit. Miraculously, sometime later, a child persuaded several people to go to the site of the saint's grave and imploring the people to dig. Without much effort, the amazed peasants unearthed the incorrupt relics of the holy martyr, which were, car which were carried with much reverence to the Church of the Most Holy Theotokos in the monastery where the saint had faithfully served Christ. Since many miracles have been granted at that gravesite of the beloved saint, multitudes of pilgrims come to honor the memory and life of this loving, good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. With great love, the Holy Church celebrates his memory on September 5, 18. St. Athanasius. Now, if we say his life, that doesn't mean we hate Roman, Catholic, uh, Roman Catholics. No. It means we hate what they, what they do in the name because they're heretics. What can you do? We hate their religion. Now, in this time of ecumenism, where we have the New Calendar churches, the ecumenist churches, and they have new saints, brand new saints that they have that they have um, canonized and said that this person is a saint. And when did he die? Yeah, just 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And you think, why did they, why did they canonize or proclaim this person a saint? It's because he was under the same bishops that the people who canonized him are under. In other words, he was an ecumenist just like they are an ecumenist. Now, who are these? Oh, this one called Father Paisius of Mount Athos. And people are confused. They think that the man is holy and that if the man is holy and he said his bishop is holy and he commemorates an ecumenist bishop, well, one and one make two. Your logic, you go say, well, then the bishop must be okay. If he says Bartholomew is God's gift to the Orthodox Church, and he's a saint, and he works miracles, well, Bartholomew, the Mason, is the gift to the Orthodox Church. But no, that's not how it works. Not uh, miracles are not a criterion for orthodoxy. Our Savior said, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of the heavens, but the one who doeth the will of my Father in the heavens. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in thy name. In other words, I was a clairvoyant. 
We cast out demons in thy name. I help throw out a demon from someone. And many works of power in thy name I did. Did we not? In other words, I worked miracles. Ain't I with you? Ain't I a saint? Then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work lawlessness. So Christ is telling us the criteria that you must have. What is the criteria? If the person is truly orthodox, then you can believe, you can believe that this person works a miracle. But if the person is a heretic, what's the use of believing him in anything? If the person is an ecumenist, what, what business that a, does a true Orthodox Christian have in believing him? Because not only do heretics, but also unbelievers, pagans, who are the ones that levitate? Uh, Hindus, shamans, they work wonders. I wonder, uh, do we have pictures of, uh, of a person just up in the air? Do we could put out a picture of someone? And they say, oh, that's a miracle. Look it. He's rising. He's a saint. That's not the criteria. The criteria is he cannot be a heretic. So if Paisius or Father uh, Ephraim or or any of these new ones who died just recently and are glorified by the, by the ecumenists. If they are ecumenists and they are heretics, there's no reason, no reason to even think that they are holy because they're working their, let me say, mischief. Not through Christ, but through the, through the absence of Christ, like St. Pahomius said. Okay, what's the latest? There's some, what's the latest news? Yes, there is a, there is a, uh, an interfaith church center being constructed in Moscow by the Moscow Patriarchate, by the, by the people, by the people in Russia. And you say, how can this be? Well, they're not truly orthodox, as we've been trying to tell you, even though there are millions of them. They call themselves orthodox, but they're ecumenists. And so what are they doing now? They're constructing an interfaith cultural center, an educational center in the Kolonaka section of Moscow, and that will begin later this year. The site will include an Orthodox church, a mosque, a Jewish temple, a Buddhist temple, representing what the Russian Constitution recognizes as the four traditional religions of Russia. What? There's only one traditional religion of Russia. But I told you, these people are ecumenists. They're ecumenists. So now you have this four traditional religions of Russia. Huh. And this is such, such foolishness. But what do you expect? They're ecumenists. The site will include a social center, activities, public activities, blah, 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 blah. We believe, said the Mufti, Albir Kardanov, head of the spiritual assembly of Muslims in Russia. 
we believe that this project will be an important contribution to strengthening inter-ethnic and inter-religious harmony. And he said this at a meeting with President Vladimir Putin and the Public Chamber of Russian Federation in November. So, if anybody believes that these people are orthodox, they should think again. There has to be a big miracle. And it's got to be a big miracle if these people are ever going to wake up. Now, what did we... Uh, what did we have? Okay, so we should we go to which we go to? Okay, before we finish this, let us go to the kiss of Judas, the Philemata to Yuda. On page <clears throat> two eighty four, the Patriarchate of Alexandria cooperates. With Freemasonry is the headline. And the article reads, Grand Lodge of Greece, festive event in the Hilton Hotel on 6 18, 1988 at the invitation of the Council of the Grand Lodge of Greece was celebrated by the brothers of the Masonic Lodges of Athens and Parias. Parias is the support of Athens. With guests, guests, brothers from Cyprus and Rhodes and Mytilene, Zakynthos, Patras, Kalamata, and Corinth. Okay, so have brothers so you got to assume there's Mana, Ma, uh, Masonic lodges in all these places. Cyprus, Rhodes, Mytilene, Zakynthos, all over. To a solemn and massive gathering at the Hilton Hotel in Athens for the end of the year yearly activities of the Masonic year of 1987-1988 and the summer solstice. Wow. Are these people orthodox? The event was honored with the presence of Metropolitan Titus of Leotopolis, Patriarchate of Alexandria. The assembled brothers and their wives, as well as the visitors, were addressed by the most glorious great teacher and most beloved brother, Christos uh, Menatis, with a few rich substance words. He also offered Metropolitan Titus a check for 500,000 drachmas on behalf of the Greek masonry, on behalf of Greek masonry for the needs of the distressed population of Ethiopia. In continuous his eminence, the Metropolitan then spoke. He thanked for the donation and mentioned that the church of his diocese, that in the church of his diocese, Masons offered significant help from time to time. And he also stated that a commemorative plaque is embedded in the sanctuary above the church as uh, is preserved, uh, stating the fact of their donations. This is taken from Masonic Bulletin, July, September 1988. So, you Greeks have to understand you're being infected in two different ways. Masonry and ecumenism, heresy. 
But now, let's go and uh, mention that something happened on Saturday other than the church celebrating the feast of the Most Holy Nativity of the Theotokos. Okay, everybody should realize that on Saturday, yesterday, <clears throat> September 8th, the church celebrated the Nativity of the Virgin. But what was happening in the world? There are wars going on in the world. We have a Jewish leader in Israel who is performing a, a general genocide and killing people. And we have a Jewish leader in uh, the Ukraine who is constantly asking for weapons to fight Russia. And the United States, of course, is duped in helping both of these crazy Jewish leaders. And, and we are sending arms. Now, it's sad to hear what happened, but Zelensky has been pleading. He's losing the war and he's pleading, give us permission to use your missiles to attack inside Russia as if that's going to do anything. He wants to send a missile, a, a missile from probably uh, England or Germany and to hit a city in Russia as if that's going to stop the troops that are at his back door in the Ukraine. It's going to do nothing. It's just going to cause a big big, big problem. Now, these missiles have to be programmed. And Zelensky doesn't know how to program. The Ukrainians don't know how to program because they're sophisticated missiles that are only made by the West in England. And these missiles, if they're being sent from Great Britain or Germany, uh, they have to be programmed, and they, and they can only be programmed with the United States helping them. So the Russians are saying, if you shoot missiles and hit our cities, it's like the United States, we are at war with the United States. And they told them, <clears throat> if you do such a thing and use these nuclear missiles... We're telling you that we will retaliate. And our, our people here are saying, oh, they're just bluffing. They're just bluffing. And it goes on like this. And now we come to the time when uh, the direct order was put on Biden's desk that he gives authorization for NATO forces to shoot missiles into Russia. And the Russians told them, please don't do this. Understand that if you do this, you're declaring, declaring war on us. Don't attack us because we will retaliate. And a nuclear exchange is going to be the death of everybody. But it will probably be worse for us because the missiles that Russia has are supersonic missiles. They cannot be stopped. But the missiles that we have can be stopped to some extent by, by their, by their uh, defense systems. So we're telling them, don't attack us because that's an act of war. And so now the order was put on Biden's table, on his desk. And that's all he had to do was just sign it. And immediately, the missiles would have gone. And so they, they gave them one 
more chance with the, uh, uh, I, I think it was a, uh, the, the phone of the back room, I guess, or something like this, the phone that <clears throat> direct access to the president and to the president of, of Russia. And they said, look, our missiles are already programmed now. We are going to take out this city, that city, that city, that city. If you dare to attack us, you're going to lose these cities within, within an hour or two hours. They're going to be gone. And then finally, someone told Biden, look, these people are not bluffing. They're serious. We cannot attack them and think that we're going to survive. And so Biden did not sign. So we were very close to having the greatest catastrophe in the history of the world on Saturday. Now, our media is not going to tell us this, but they told us some things. There was news that uh, there was a final decision was made by the White House. They backed down somehow and they did not give permission to fire these storm shadow cruise missiles and American attack missiles from NATO. That's all was told to us in the media. And lo and behold, now we know the whole story that if they did that, they were de <laughs> the West was declaring war on Russia. And Russia has the biggest military in the world. So, thank God we averted a, a catastrophe. But then you go and look at Palestine and you say, hey, there's another catastrophe here in the making with this other Jew that's just killing as many non-Jews as he can. So we have two wars led by mentally ill people. What could happen in provoking all the Muslims in Palestine? by just killing and killing all the Muslims in Gaza, the West Bank, and now they're going to go into Lebanon. They're provoking the other Muslims to say, stop, stop. <clears throat> and they may use weapons, nuclear weapons. What a crazy world we live in. Okay, let's clean our memories from all of this. And read from the Philokalia. And this is St. Mark the Ascetic. Ah, uh, if you want your sins to be covered by the Lord, do not display your virtues to others. Mm. How do you like that? For whatever we do with our virtues, God will also do with our sins. And then he says, having hidden your virtue, do not be filled with pride, imagining you have achieved righteousness. For righteousness is not only to hide your good actions, but also never to think forbidden thoughts. Never think forbidden thoughts. Cut the thoughts off that are forbidden. Be ashamed. Okay, Philokali, uh, this is my life in Christ, St. John of Constant. Ah, do not breathe malice, vengeance, and murder toward, even towards animals, lest your own soul should be given up to death by the spiritual enemy, breathing wickedness in you, even towards dumb animals. Mm -hmm. Lest and lest you should become accustomed to the breath of malice and vengeance against men also. Remember that animals are called to life by God's mercy, that they may enjoy their existence as much as they can endure their short life. Remember, this is St. John of Constant. Back in those days, Automobiles were not the main. It was horses. Remember that animals are called to life 
by God's mercy, that they may enjoy their existence as much as they can during their short life. That they may enjoy their existence. That's nice. Mm. The Lord is good to all. Do not beat them, even if they are unreasonable, or if they play tricks, or if any of your property is damaged by them. Do not beat them. Mm. Blessed is the man who is merciful to his beasts. Sometimes they play tricks. Okay, thank you all for listening. God be with you and bless you and have a wonderful week.